So let's start. We're very happy to have uh, Carlo here from Imperial. Uh, Carlo has an as I learned, extensive experience uh, from C already, having been a couple of years in the beginning of the 2000s and mm -hmm. then uh, for another year in Spanish. Years ago. A few years ago, yeah. Uh, his um, main research interests are in various forms of cosmological analysis and mm -hmm. also various ex extensions on that. But now, finally, he's found this true calling yeah. the appropriate <laughs> science of gravitational waves, uh, which he will tell us about today. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, well, it's where the money is, right? So, you know, how can you blame me, right? Um, uh, well, it's great to be back. And um, I did see Dick was in his office, but I guess he's still doing his usual come in 20 minutes late. And at that point, I'll just resummarize everything I've said so far for him, right? He's still doing that, I'm sure. Um, but when he walks in, don't start laughing, because, you know. OK, so um, yeah, this is. Um, uh, well, I'm glad there's some LIGO people here because the, the, they'll be able to sort of be interesting to see their feedback on some of this work that I've been doing. Um, <clears throat> the work is actually <clears throat> um, covered in a, in a number of recent papers, but um, mostly what I'll be talking about today is a paper uh, done as part of my students' um, uh, research project, uh, so this uh, most recent paper here. Um, okay, so. I can't really do a talk without showing um, a map of the CMB, even though I'm not really going to be talking about the CMB. But I just put this up because I still remember the day that uh, I first saw this 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 picture here, uh, and it was pinned to a notice board because back then, you know, th things were pinned in, on notice boards, and uh, it was I think 1993 because I must have been in the first year of my undergraduate, so it must have been the second release of Kobe data, and I remember it not because this totally uh, made me, you know, realize my true calling. But uh, this friend came up to me and said, yeah, look at this, this is amazing. It's, you know, and I, and I just went, well, what is it? You know, uh, and uh, he said, it's ripples in the cosmos and all these things. And I went, yes, yeah, so what, you know. Um, but um, it's a testament to the power of this map that I've just spent the last 20 years or so uh, basically uh, not working directly towards this map because I didn't work on Planck, but uh, certainly about 10%, between 10% and 15% of the sky, um, you know, Dick and I sort of massaged by hand into existence pretty much, uh, and then finally culminating in the Planck map. So, um, you know, as a cosmologist, I tend to think of backgrounds, so that's delta T over T. Um, but one thing to point out is that um, it took a long time to get there, and of course, um, to begin with, there was a detection of the monopole of the CMB uh, in, in the 60s, okay? So that was one number, okay, one observation, okay? And then between the 60s and the early 90s, okay, um, it was pretty slow going. So somewhere in between the dipole was measured, and that's basically three numbers, okay? That's three observations. Uh, and finally, then when Kobe came out, this, you know, has about a thousand pieces of useful uh, signal information, basically. So let's um, be a bit fanciful and start thinking about delta omega gravitational waves over omega gravitational waves, okay? Fluctuations in the gravitational wave background. Uh, so when I see something like this, we have six events now detected. Uh, the positions on this map have nothing to do with where they are. I just put down some, some things. So there's six things being measured. Okay, there's six observations. So that's a lot more than three that was around for about 30 years for the CMB. And so I think I'm pretty justified in thinking, OK, soon we'll be getting maps like the CMB. OK, so pretty much the talk, the, the flavor of this talk is how do we go from here to something like that, OK, for gravitational waves. So the central object I'll be talking about here is, is a background of gravitational waves. But I don't want to restrict right now as to, as to the nature of that background, because I'll mention backgrounds of various uh, sources and, and nature, OK? Uh, so uh, you know, uh, I have to put my LIGO slide on with this beautiful detection of um, 
the uh, uh, multi-messenger source uh, that was the most recent detection. Uh, I'm going to stop that because that's really annoying, but, but it shows you know, the Fermi observations following from the, the little chirp. Um, <clears throat> so here's LIGO, one of the LIGO sites. This, I think, was the original detection. Does it look familiar? That's the original detection, the squiggles, as I call them. Uh, and uh, the most, most recently, of course, uh, with Virgo joining the network of detectors, the, the two original LIGO ones and Virgo, that was the big thing with this latest detection where you can triangulate on the sky. That will be relevant for things I'm going to be talking about uh, in a minute. Okay, and of course there's this big effort now of detecting individual events in the time streams. Okay, essentially seeing things like that in the time stream going, ah, there's, there's a source has gone off. Uh, of course now they're just the sort of the final in spirals of massive objects and then also observing them with all other telescopes in, in different uh, 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 frequency ranges. So it's really exciting. Um, <clears throat> but uh, this is what I'm immediately jump to. Uh, this is a very cartoonish way of justifying what I'll be talking about. Um, so out there, there is a population of, of sources. Um, <clears throat> the population will be distributed according to some characteristic variable of that population. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but that would include some sort of, uh, you know, masses of the sources or distribution in redshift, volume, uh, scales, etc., but it'll be some sort of uh, something that look a bit like a Gaussian, not quite. Um, but when you're trying to measure these sources, or you're trying to think about measuring the integrated signal of all these sources, what you're doing is just essentially uh, doing counts of things. So that's like uh, you're taking the cumulative, the 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 integral of that distribution, i.e., a cumulative distribution uh, function. Okay. So if you think of that population. Um, the cumulative distribution function for that population being some, some curve like this. I just use the Gaussian, but just for illustration. Uh, the things we're detecting now here in LIGO are the rarest, uh, rarest of those events, right, of that population. They're the, the most massive systems uh, uh, that are giving you the signal that is above your noise threshold that you can detect directly at large signal to noise. Um, so below a certain detection threshold, then there's an intermediate population of things that are going off much more frequently, okay, in your data. They're in your data, but you can't really detect them, okay? As, as good a match filtering technique that you'd have or some sort of estimation method you'd have, you're just simply not able to say, oh, I've seen that so individual source at more than three sigma. There. It'll always be around two sigma, et cetera. Um, and in your time stream, that will look a bit like uh, shot noise. It'll have some sort of Poisson statistic, okay? And for LIGO, because LIGO sees a certain kind of, of, of event, it, basically in spirals, um, <clears throat> that will extend in some way quite far below the detection threshold, okay? So there'll, there'll be this scattering of signals that you can't quite detect in your time stream. And then past that, there'll be a sort of a more continuous... Uh, 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 sort of uh, injection of signals from many more things, okay, because you're integrating further into that population, and uh, it'll approach some sort of continuous uh, background, which will have, will have much more Gaussian statistics. So this, this is a very hand wavy way of, of thinking about this. Yeah? So, does this take, take into account the um, possible effect of optimization, the fact that subsystems even will not be emit a single graviton within their lifetime? A quantization in, the, in time of the signal. A quantization of the finite energy. You can only emit, uh, um, there's a minimum threshold that you need to, uh, of energy that you need to emit within, within your lifetime, right? Yes. So if you emit less than one. Uh, sure, of course. Yeah, no, no. I mean, this figure doesn't take into account of anything. It's literally drawn by hand, okay? This is just a hand wavy thing. But that, that, that just is. That will go into here in the x axis, the definition of the x axis, how you characterize the events that you're seeing and the particular population that you're seeing because experiments, um, well, in fact, thinking about LISA, which is a space uh, mission, uh, that will see many more different kinds of, of events. Um, I'll go into that in a second. But essentially, this is how that sort of hand wavy picture will change. First of all, you'll see a lot more sources detected basically at high signal to noise above your detection threshold. And then there will, there will be an intermediate level of 
uh, signal in your uh, time stream, in your data, that will look like shot noise, okay? But because Lisa is sensitive to all kinds of backgrounds and, and, and sort of uh, including um, much longer term signals, quiescent phases, etc., cetera, um, uh, the, the sort of that continuous population uh, being injected into your time stream is going to be much closer to, to that detection threshold in some ways. I'm sort of trying to justify in, in a very hand wave, wavy way um, the statistics of this. And basically, um, the thing you have in your favor here is that you can integrate in time, okay? And the times are fairly long. So if you think about an individual detection right now with LIGO, it's on the order of a few seconds, but the instrument is running for on the order of months, you know, and soon you know, integrated time will be years of observations, right? So that's a large factor in your one over root n, okay? So um, basically, it'll be guaranteed that these kind of experiments will observe some form of continuous uh, stochastic background at some point if you integrate sufficiently long in time. Um, so as I mentioned Lisa, so I'll, I'll just show a little introductory Slide. So Lisa is a space mission. It's a laser interferometer, <clears throat> and um, so it's three spacecraft co-orbiting with the Earth. So they launch off, and they basically they're injected into slightly tilted orbits, so that it looks like essentially they're orbiting a, a center of mass, but it's a fictitious center of mass. It's, it's a nice little orbital problem. Um, the scales are uh, vastly bigger than, than LIGO, okay, so we're talking about the, the arms being millions of kilometers versus um, uh, the kilometer scales of LIGO, so they're measuring very different frequencies, much lower frequencies. Um, and, um, uh, well, the important thing is, 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 is the launch date, which is 2034, um, as now planned, okay? Um, and, and much of what I'm talking today is, is actually aimed at LISA, as opposed to LIGO, despite LIGO being the thing uh, we've done a sort of an application to. So in terms of <coughs> objects being probed by LISA, there's obviously a, a problem with the noise issue. Uh, is there any problem? You know, usually it's cast in a framework of really big black holes. Yeah. Can it actually have the sensitivity to get the uh, sort of huge amount of background of very long wave? It should. I'll show a slide in a second where there's curves and you know showing the quiescent phases of, of binary systems. So you know much longer time scale. So what Lisa's talking about now, which is really quite cool, is you're seeing the signal of the yeah. binary system for years, right, and then you're basically able to predict, oh, you know, in 10 years' time, you'll see the final in-spiral with your LIGO uh, at, at your uh, short frequencies, right? So, so the sensitivities are such that you will see many systems, not just the in-spirals of supermassive systems themselves, which is the LIGO-type little chirp, but you're seeing the sea of, of uh, and, and actually of different population sources. I'll show the the, the, the slide in a second. Um, just a note on uh, basically what we're measuring. The basic measurement here is of, of strain H, which is <clears throat> basically a perturbation around, around your Minkowski uh, metric. Um, just like we've been measuring for many years now, scalar perturbations, okay. Um, these are tensor perturbations, so you go to the IJ component of your metric perturbation and you can distill it down into two polarizations, usually denoted as cross and uh, plus and times, plus and cross. Just one note here because it's, I may not get to mention it in, in detail, but it's important here to remember that, that um, the, uh, the spin of these objects is uh, spin two. That means that they rotate uh, with this phase, and S here is 2, so it rotates as e to the i 2 times the angle, uh, which is why you denote it as a cross, because it sort of rotates into itself four times. Um, now, comparing that to, say, for example, electromagnetism, which, is, uh, which has spin 1, so it rotates into itself, uh, uh, you know, once as you rotate around the circle, <clears throat> you know, if you think of Q and, uh, Q and U Stokes parameters. And, of course, for a scalar, quantity, that would be zero, so it's independent of the rotation. I mentioned that just because I might have mentioned uh, things about spin um, in a little bit. Um, okay, just to introduce some of the notation, 
uh, the strain you'll see it typically expanded in this way. So this, um, the, your metric perturbation can be um, expanded in frequency, okay, and in directions, okay, hat here is, is your direction vector, okay, um, this will be the, the domain in which we describe things um, most uh, often. This is just a polarization vector which describes the, the pluses and crosses. I'll drop that essentially because I'll be focusing on, non on intensity as, a, as opposed to polarization. Um, <clears throat> and then you have waves, okay? So these are plane waves. And it's important to remember that these are traveling waves, okay? These are truly traveling waves. Um, <clears throat> So the phase of the wave is dependent on the dot product of your direction with your position, and there's also a C times time. I'll, I'll drop factors of C, et cetera, too, uh, later. Um, but um, I think of this as simply uh, as, a, uh, as waves that we measure. Okay, they're polarized, so to describe them, okay, so to measure the amplitude of these waves, what do you have to do? Of course, if you integrate just a sinusoid, it goes to zero, but you take the square of it and integrate it in some, some way. An ensemble bracket here denotes basically time averaging. Um, you can describe the degrees of freedom using Stokes parameters. So I, Q, U, and V. Q and U are linear polarization. In this case, they're related to pluses and crosses. And V is the circular polarization. And I is the intensity. And I'll focus on the intensity in, in this talk here. So you can define something like a strain intensity. I come from a CMB background, so some people doing CMB here will recognize the language. It's slightly different in gravitational waves, okay? But so let's call this intensity. So it's the sum of the cross correlation of the two polarization modes. Uh, so yeah, compare it to, to electromagnetic intensity, okay? It's, it's exactly the same thing. <clears throat> and it's in the square of the strain, okay? So it's second order in the strain H. So what is a gravitational wave background? Okay, so if we think just about the intensity, let's forget about polarization for now. <clears throat> we can define a, a gravitational wave background by looking at the energy density of that stuff, in this case, gravitational waves. There's a frequency dependence in this case. So you can define it by taking the derivative with respect to log f. You divide by the critical energy density and you get a dimensionless uh, uh, density for the gravitational wave. The interesting thing here is that it is frequency dependent, okay, and it's related to the intensity that I just defined in this way. There's factors of f that cancel out two factors in, in uh, inverse time here, and the fact that the frequency dependence in, in, in I. Um, and so cosmologists, of course, the first thing that you're interested in is, oh, wow, okay, I know that the inflation sets up a, a gravitational wave background. Can I measure it? Um, <clears throat> so, for example, the uh, a, a gravitational wave background due to inflation, if you think of the energy scale of inflation denoted by some sort of potential of, of, the, of your inflationary mechanism, it's modulated by the uh, redshift of equality, but it's essentially a, a flat in, in scale, the scale invariant except for this, uh, a break in the scale set by equality here. And you can work out roughly that uh, the level predicted by inflation at 10 to the 16 GeV, well, it comes out to 10 to the minus 15, but on this plot that I ripped off uh, uh, one of the standard papers on this, it's 10 to the, around 10 to the minus 14. Uh, so for the frequency range involved here, it's a, a, it's a flat spectrum, but very, very small amplitude, okay? So here we're plotting, this is one way to plot uh, gravitational wave background sensitivities or, or measurements. Uh, this is omega gravitational wave, this, this uh, uh, dimensionless background density. This is frequency. <clears throat> and here you can see various limits. Uh, this this is, goes a few years back, so it's a bit out of date now, but sort of earlier uh, uh, versions of LIGO, and this is advanced La LIGO where we're about now. This is LISA. So at smaller frequencies, lot longer baselines, okay? The CMB measures stuff out here on, on very low frequencies. But the thing to notice here is that uh, CMB measures a certain range in frequencies, but potentially, given measurements between sort of Earth-based and space-based um, 
interferometers or detectors, you have access to a lot more e-foldings of inflation, right, of, of information, a lot more, re big, a much larger range and scales, which of course is a, an interesting thing. But of course, the thing that you notice immediately is that uh, uh, there's a big gap between the sensitivity of even LISA 2034 and what you predict from your basic model of inflation, okay? So you wouldn't bet a career on saying, oh, we're going to measure the inflationary background using uh, uh, gravitational waves, okay? <clears throat> now, another way to present the information, but this is probably more familiar to people involved in measurements of uh, gravitational waves or the strain, is uh, measuring S, which is a spectral density uh, of H, okay? S is related to the intensity that I introduced before in this way and omega gravitational waves, okay, in this way. There's a factor of F3 uh, and normally uh, they plot the square root of the, of the spectrum, so it's an amplitude, okay, so it's in units. So you see the sort of a typical amplitude of H is, is, is very small, but your inflationary background now is, is tilted because of that factor of three half, F to the three halves. Um, and you plot your sensitivity curves here. Okay, so these are noise curves of so the various uh, uh, LIGO. So that that this so we're, we should be approaching the advanced LIGO nominal noise here. That's Lisa. Uh, I won't mention much about pulsar timing arrays, but that's another way you can measure gravitational waves on even larger scales, so lower frequencies. Okay, so that's certainly something that many people are working on. There are very nice limits produced by PTAs already. But things like the square kilometer array will, will transform that field and, and really uh, um, uh, provide much stringent, much more stringent uh, upper limits. But, well, they should really detect things at some point. Um, so if you think of the detection so far, this is the sort of signal you see here. I know PDAs are a running joke if you're working on LIGO. <laughs> I, I, I heard that. Um, um, they're supposed, they're always claiming that the detection is going to be in the next six months, you know, but they've been doing that for many years. Um, okay, so, so this is the kind of detection that you're seeing now. This single event has, has some profile here, and you can see it's much higher than the noise. But of course, <clears throat> uh, if you think of different possible sources of gravitational waves, um, uh, this is the kind of landscape you'll get. Um, so LIGO is sensitive to certain, certain types of um, uh, events. Um, the ones we're seeing for now is, is compact binary uh, in spirals. LISA will see different kind of events, some of them related, okay? So they'll see much more massive things. They'll see a lot of galactic binary system, uh, systems. They will resolve, that you, they'll be able to resolve, and also a lot of unresolved stuff. Okay, uh, and um, some of the systems seen here will then appear in this frequency band much later on. Okay, that, that's a really incredible thing. Lisa will say, "Oh, you know, this this thing will go off, and they'll know exactly where 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 it is and on the sky, and you just wait for it for LIGO." That that's really a shockingly amazing thing to think about. Um, uh, PDAs will, are going to be uh, sensitive to a certain class of supermassive binaries, but also to sort of stochastic backgrounds of various types. It's not quite clear what people mean by stochastic background. It, it's, it's sort of a, it's a, it's a strange thing to call things. But, uh, but all of these, of course, it, it doesn't help you. This F to three halves doesn't help you. The inflationary background is always very, you know, orders of magnitude below your detection threshold for any of these experiments. Um, <clears throat> okay, one thing to, uh, that I think is good to point out is, is how the, the source of your gravitational wave background actually has very strong implications for what you're actually going to measure. And the way I like to split it down is into something which is primordial and everything else is astrophysical. And prime, yeah. Why do you neglect like the possibility of phase transition? Why do you neglect like the possibility of phase transition? Uh, basically, um, there, phase transitions. I know, but that's why I'm going to explain my, my naming convention. By primordial, it's, by primordial I mean something which has been outside the horizon and then re-entered. That's, that's, my, that's my cut. Because that has very specific observational consequences. So something which is primordial, which spent time outside the horizon, essentially 
gets squeezed, its momentum goes to zero. So these are, gravitational waves are traveling waves, but their momentum go to zero. And so what happens is that when they re-enter the horizon, you essentially get uh, phase, temporal phase coherence between, uh, from, from different directions, okay? This is the same thing that sets up a s different kind of coherence in the CMB, but what it means is that a truly primordial background will set up a background of standing waves because left and right traveling waves are going to be correlated. Their phase is going to be correlated in, in a particular way. Anything that is sourced inside the horizon, including early universe phase transitions, okay, um, is not going to be like that. It's, it's going to be, so the, all the individual sources are going, to be, are going to be uncorrelated in the temporal phase. Okay, so they're going, to, uh, they're going to make up an incoherent background. And that actually has interesting observational consequences. Um, <clears throat> and that is because gravitational wave detectors are coherent detectors. So you can say something about the coherence of the signal as a function of position on the sky. Um, I can't go into that in detail, but there's, uh, I'm happy to uh, talk to you about it uh, later on. It's a, sort of a fairly complicated thing, but it should be very familiar to anybody that's done radio astronomy, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so instead, for all incoherent background, and most of the things that we think gravitational wave detectors will see are going to be incoherent background. There's, they're going to be things inside the horizon going off all the time. And, and the signals will be, uh, of course, the event from each signal has a nice little temporal phase, which, of course, is, is critical in its measurement. But if you want to th think of integrating all the signals, then uh, you're dealing with an incoherent signal, okay? Um, so unless it's a single event, that's, uh, the, the phase information is not useful. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> but we've been essentially, uh, this, this is nothing new. Measuring an incoherent signal with a coherent detector is nothing new. Uh, we were doing it in CMB. It's not so popular right now in CMB, but uh, uh, low frequencies and radio astronomy, we were measuring uh, CMB photons. Each CMB photon is not correlated temporally with other CMB photons. They're all released at the last scattering surface in an incoherent manner. CMB has a spatial coherence uh, which is, uh, which is, of course, leads to uh, uh, acoustic peaks, etc. But those, that's a different uh, type of coherence. Um, and so, yeah, we were doing this in CMB. It's a, uh, you use coherent detectors at low frequency. Um, so I can't help showing this slide. Uh, this is CBI. Okay, CBI was a network of radio uh, antennas. Um, and you, you, took, you, you know, interfered the signal of all the antennas. You got a certain number of baselines. And at one point, in fact, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, a lot of the measurements that were populating this, the angular power spectrum were coming from uh, uh, radio interferometry measurements of the CMB. Okay? So, so there's nothing new. You know, and Dick will certainly recognize these, these pictures. We spent years coming out with those tiny little patches. Um, so let me just go on to, uh, okay, so there's the uh, gravitational wave background itself, so an average background, okay, but there's also information in any anisotropy in that background, okay? So again, the analogy with CMB is that there's information in the anisotropy. So I'll be a bit, little bit controversial, but say any gravitational wave background will have anisotropies in it, for sure, okay? And I would say that levels that you will, you will detect Guaranteed. I'll put that. I'll put my money down on that. Okay. The source mechanism. Even if you think of these incoherent sub-horizon astrophysical, what I call astrophysical uh, sources, uh, is not uniform. They're distributed, and you know the universe is not smooth. Okay. Uh, so it's irrelevant for primordial ones, but it's important for astrophysical backgrounds. And also, gravitational waves are uh, perturbed along the line of sight uh, because they're traveling along a perturbed geodesic, okay? So the fact that the universe is perturbed at first order by scalar perturbations itself implies that there will be anisotropies. Uh, so in fact, uh, I had a bit of fun a couple of years ago working out how to calculate anisotropies in a gravitational wave background. And if you work in CMB, you will recognize this equation here. This is the angular power spectrum of um, a, a background, which is basically uh, a convolution of an, a primordial power spectrum in the scalar perturbations. This is a primordial power spectrum of, uh, of curvature perturbations 
times uh, an angular uh, transfer function. Uh, and it's exactly the same calculation that you can do to calculate this, this object here, the angular power spectrum of the CMB, okay? Except that now, when you think of the monopole of the CMB, okay, that's just the T, T CMB. Now we're talking about uh, a monopole is, is just the background itself, the value of the background. The interesting thing here is that there is a frequency dependence uh, of the background. There's frequency information. And then the delta T over T is the delta omega over omega GW, okay? which are the anisotropies. It's the CLs with L larger than zero, right? One, two, three, et cetera. Okay, again, there's frequency dependent, which is something which in CMB we don't deal with because it's a black body, so we, we uh, refer it to a black body. Uh, but in fact, the analogy goes even closer. If you look at how to calculate the subject here, I'll just show this for people that know CMB, but this, this angular transfer function is an integral in time of a source function. And in fact, you can write it down exactly pretty much identically to you, the way you would write it down for CMB, okay, so in terms of uh, an intrinsic perturbation at the source, uh, a Sachs-Wolf effect at the source, a Doppler effect. Um, this, this sigma here is, instead of being uh, the scattering rate of CMB photons, it's just an emissivity rate. It's not the way astrophysicists define, uh, you know, but this would involve merger rates, et cetera, in your population uh, statistics. Uh, and there's also an integrated Sachs-Wolf effect, actually. So you can write everything down like that, which is, which is really neat. Um, so in fact, actually using that, you can actually calculate what, what kind of anisotropies would I see in a gravitational wave background, okay? And again, you have to make the distinction between primordial and astrophysical here. So for example, if I had a, an inflationary background or something that's set up on super and scales that then re-enter, uh, basically it's a very simple uh, calculation, you get an intrinsic uh, perturbation due to your source mechanism, which sources H cross and pluses. Uh, you get a Sachs-Wolf effect due to the curvature perturbation at the source. This would be at this primordial source of, of gravitational waves. And then you get an ISW effect. This G here is the growth function, so it's, it's time derivative. It's just the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. And this is just the transfer function, which is one on large scales. Um, uh, <clears throat> instead for astrophysical objects, it's the same exact terms, um, but what you'd get here is now your sources are distributed in time, so the emissivity of your sources is, is, is non-trivial. Um, your ISW effect is here, this is actually the Sachs-Wolf effect, and this is the intrinsic perturbation due to the sources. All this is is basically you have sources, they're biased with respect to the under, underlying dark matter. The bias factor here is large, about three for typical uh, massive objects. Uh, and all your astrophysics goes into this term here. So actually doing this, you can calculate what, the, uh, what these anisotropies would look like. So for a primordial one, you'll see something which is dominated by the large scales. So this is basically a Sachs-Wolf effect uh, and ISW effect. So uh, tell me about why these three, I mean, there are well, maybe more in plus Three plus or minus. Yeah. You know, um, the Milky Way, uh, no, I just I just uh, took a number that I saw most often in the literature, but that number changes. I mean, it's not well, clear at all what that number is. Yeah, it, but it, it's a large number, and it's also multiplying a factor in k squared, which means that it's basically a Poissonian process. Okay, so more or less heavily biased with respect to the dark matter. Okay, but that three is nobody's really calculated that quantity that bias in a careful way. Um, so, so, but look at, you know, the, the scale here is relevant, okay? 10 to the minus five for primordial. So it's 10 to the minus five below the, the omega GW that you haven't even detected yet, okay? So, um, but the astrophysical one, <clears throat> it's basically a Poisson uh, distribution on the sky, uh, but it's large. So it's on the order of a few percent of omega gravitational waves. So actually, if you could integrate past omega gravitational waves to the percent level, you should be able to see something like this. So th and and to, to calculate this thing here, I just put some sort of merge rate peaking at redshift equals to one. It's, you know, I'm not an expert at these things, but I just made some toy model, okay, semi-realistic toy model. Okay, what are the current limits that we have now uh, in terms of the gravitational wave background? Um, so here we go. So I've gone back to this plot, which is basically a function of omega gravitational waves. 
different types of gravitation of sources will give you different frequency dependence and normally it's parameterized by this power law alpha with respect to frequency uh, and it's normally split between astro but now astro means actual astrophysical uh, sources so in spiral the type of thing that LIGO is seeing and a cosmological one the cosmological one being frequent uh, frequency independent in in uh, terms of omega GW and sort of these are sort of um, upper limits that have been most recently published by LIGO you know on the order of 10 to the minus 7 it depends slightly on the frequency dependence that you're looking at for your source mechanism um, <clears throat> Okay, so, so the yeah, I, I, I haven't looked into cosmic strings in, in detail, even though I should have, I come from them, but, um, but uh, I, yeah, I haven't. So this is something that peaks inside the horizon, you know, some, some, some sort of, and then I guess I don't know, know where that scale invariance comes from, but um, yeah, I'm not that familiar with, with cosmic string limits. But certainly it looks from here that you've sort of already ruled out some sort of scenario. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and also they have no large-scale power because they can't extend the. Yeah, to the, the reality is the cosmic string limit from pulsars has not really improved. It's not that. The reason it hasn't improved is because they started to look more serious. Yeah. Sources Yeah, your early claims were a somewhat overblown limit, and so then now it's. Uh, it's an improving field, and it's in just in time because the things that you need also are timing. Uh, no, I don't at all. No, absolutely not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, <laughs> sorry. The, uh, these are all, I guess, limits on uh, loop uh, emission from of gravitational waves, right? So loop radiation. It must be not from large-scale cosmic string dynamics, right? Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Um, Okay, but for the rest of the talk, I just want to go over this exercise of actually trying to basically reconstruct those maps that I, I was just showing. Okay, so if I had data, how do I make maps of, of, uh, of the gravitational wave sky? Um, <clears throat> so the exercise into, uh, is, is to basically reconstruct the monopole and anisotropies. Uh, I want to do that integrating all the data. I don't want to focus on individual detection of, of individual sources. I know that there's this sea of underlying sources that are, haven't been detected, but they live in that, in that data. And all that's hiding them is the noise. So if I can integrate for long times, I can always dig down into that noise in principle. Uh, I want to do it um, on the sky. So I want to avoid hardwiring any choice of baselines, which has been, of course, an expedient that has been used so far with, say, a single LIGO baseline, okay? Because then the motivation for that is, of course, that there are more, more baselines or detectors coming. Um, notice uh, assumption of discrete sources. Some of the mapping algorithms so far have made uh, severe uh, 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 constraints in that respect. Uh, and also there's a choice of what domain to reconstruct the maps in, and I'll go into that in a minute. Uh, but also the biggest thing for me, uh, having done a lot of analysis of different kinds of data, is, is to start dirty and end clean. Okay, so I've spent 20 years reading papers about beautiful mathematical algorithms that are going to do amazing things, and then when data hits them, they never go, seem to go anywhere. Okay, so we have data. There's LIGO data out there, publicly available. So you start from the data and build up. Okay, and I should mention, of course, that this is a project that has, has been um, my student Arianna's project, Arianna Renzini. Here she is, operating what she told me as a nuclear reaction in a tin can. Okay, She's not allowed to do anything remotely as fun anymore. She just codes in Python now. So that, that, serves, her, that, is, that serves her well. OK, the motivation for this is that uh, making these kind of maps will be really important for Lisa. OK, Lisa will see all kinds of things on the sky. It will see the signal of the galaxy, so it will have to separate foregrounds. It's essentially the same exact exercise that CMB ha is, is in right now. You'll have to separate foregrounds. The nice thing is that you'll have lots of frequency information to separate foregrounds, but you'll also have information about the distribution of sources on the sky. Okay, so this, and maybe it's not been appreciated so much how important making maps will be, but certainly there's been certain groups that have been working on this for a number of years. Um, we identified some drawbacks to the methods that uh, have been done so far, which has sort of prompted this project. 
uh, often the reconstruction was done direct to spherical harmonic domain. And that is a natural thing to do if you come from a radio astronomy background. You think, oh, I'm doing interferometry. I have to reconstruct the Fourier domain uh, directly. I'll come back to that. Um, LIGO baseline is a preferred baseline. And you can do things much more efficiently because you're basically you can get rid of the phases. It's just rotating around the sky in, in, on a single baseline. So it makes it easy to take into account. Um, some of the mapping algorithms seem to be optimized for detecting single sources, despite the fact that they were trying to integrate uh, the time stream into uh, a background. And that's not efficient because, of course, there will be a time when you will be, uh, there will be overlapping sources in your time stream. Okay? They will not be delta functions distinct in time in your measurements. Uh, there's an issue of phase coherence. I'm not going to cover that because it's a bit technical. But um, uh, and there, there's some misconceptions in what it means, uh, um, how to describe the polarization of, of maps. But I'm not going to cover the polarization. So here's the situation today with LIGO data. We have a single baseline, the two LIGO detectors. OK, so we'll be cross-correlating information from two LIGO detectors. Notice that I've plotted the Earth in galactic coordinates. OK, so the equator is, is doing something like this here. OK, so. So the Earth is going around like this in this plotting. And I've done that because we, we wanted to go directly to sky coordinates as opposed to being in, in baseline coordinates. Um, <clears throat> so the data 01 is the, is the latest publicly released data, which was from the late 2015 run. It's a, a few months of data. Um, and within that, you have to find the data segments that are simultaneous between the two det both detectors were operating okay, at the same time so that you can cross-correlate. Um, and then what you do is you split the time stream, those few months of data, you split them down into, into 60 second segments where you can assume that the Earth is, it, it, the rotation is negligible with respect to the, to the sky. Um, <clears throat> uh, and the signal of each detector is, is, looks something like this. I thought I'd drop the polarization index, but anyway, it's still here. But you're measuring uh, your, uh, the signal on the sky as a function of direction of the sky and frequency. You integrate over the whole sky, um, modulated by a response function, which describes how sensitive you are to different gravitational waves, depending on the direction on the sky. Okay, so gravitational wave detectors, you can't beamform them because you would need something like a black hole or a ring of black holes to make a beam. That would be a cool experiment, but certainly not within reach today. So it sees the whole sky. Um, <clears throat> so this, this function, this response function is extensive on the sky. That's very different from normal astronomy. Um, and here's your little plane waves. OK, so uh, and this is a section or a 60 second section of, of the time stream. I can't remember which detector. Maybe it's both. I can't remember. But what you do is you immediately Fourier transform into the Fourier uh, domain. And um, the, the power spectrum of the data looks something like this, which is really nice. LIGO essentially sees no signal at all. So when you take a power spectrum of the data, it's the power spectrum of your noise. So you're, it's very nice, LIGO, because the signal doesn't bias your noise at all, right? So um, it's very simple to deal with. You have to deal with a lot of harmonics and things. Uh, but essentially, there's a range of data here between 80 and 300 hertz that we used in this simple exercise here. So the lines are these harmonics uh, that are, some of them are designed into the so instrument. So that it's instrumental. And then there's some, I think, Earth-based. Uh, so some of them are just harmonics of the US algorithm. Yeah. Some of them are nodes. The, the mirrors yeah, that, that, that are, that you, that you know by design. But OK. Everything, <coughs> some, some are injected uh, calibration sinusoids. But everything that would be seismic is lost because this is time integrated. Uh, well, no. I mean, here you have low enough frequencies well, that, well, that, that some, somewhere down here you would have like a lot of. Turn the, um, uh, the um, seismic noise into a stochastic noise, whereas it's actually. There, it's a component that isn't, isn't Gaussian here. Yeah. It would be down here somewhere. So if you cut the time stream short enough, right? So here are you are looking at so the, so 10 the, hertz. The noise floor there is probably dominated by like, uh, Brownian motion in the. Yeah, which is where, where, which is what you want, right? It's nice, well-behaved noise. Uh, so, well, I mean, you know, white noise, F noise, one over F noise. That's sort of, and you can fit to it. it pretty simple, and you fit every 60 second, okay? 
because this noise isn't stationary. It's it ch every time you look at the instrument again, it's changed. It's got a different level. The, the tails are fluctuating in some way. That happens mostly at, at the high frequency, though. So, um, in terms of the signal model, what we're doing is taking cross correlations of two detectors. Okay. Um, so each detector has a as a vector. The coordinate system is Earth centric. Uh, so that defines a baseline between the two detectors. Um, and uh, so this is the model for your, your data. Your data is in the, in the frequency domain. Uh, you integrate over the whole sky. This is an overlap function, but it's just a response function, combined response functions of two detectors. Okay. Again, so it's a function that rotates around the sky and covers the entire sky. This is your signal. Okay. This is the intensity uh, on the sky. We've separated out the frequency and put it there. Okay, so we're concentrating on the directional dependence. And this is your noise, okay? So there's noise, signal, convolved with some function, and that's your data. Uh, and this is just to give you an idea of, of how that response function is, looks on the sky. Uh, this is what it's doing as it rotates around the sky, okay? So it's symmetric around the detector, well, uh, the, the, uh, around the baseline. It looks like a funny rotation because it's defined around the baseline which means that you're actually rotating around the equator uh, at a particular phase. Okay, so don't worry that this doesn't look like it's tracking the Earth's equator on the sky. It's, it's just a function of the definition. Um, so that's your overlap function. So you can see it, it's, it's extensive over the sky, but it is pluses and, you know, pluses and minuses. And, well, you know, there's high, you know, close to one and close to zero at various points, uh, parts of the sky. But there's more baselines coming. So uh, already we have Virgo, which is in Italy here. And that, of course, was used uh, in, uh, in the, uh, that detection uh, to triangulate the position of, of the uh, double neutron star event. Um, uh, there's more um, Geo, uh, which apparently is, is, is running, uh, not great sensitivity. And also Kagura in Japan. Um, will come online at some point, and Carl told me it's actually quite close to coming online. So eventually, already in, uh, over the next couple of years, we're looking at 10 baselines potentially, okay? Uh, that's interesting. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of how the overlap for 10 baselines will go, the, for those 10 baselines. Um, it's not how the convolution happens, because this is you can't sum those overlap functions. You have to integrate and then sum the signal, but, it's, but essentially this is how you'll be covering the sky as the Earth rotates around, okay? So you're covering large amounts of, of the sky with these overlap functions. Um, just as an analogy with radio interferometry, which I like to make because it, just to show you how you can go into a little wrong direction is, you can think of the UV space of these experiments, okay? Except that now, it's a truly three-dimensional space. It's not UV, it's UVW, right? W is the one you chuck away because you go to the flat sky limit when you do radiant interferometry because you're looking with beamed experiments. Here, you can't do that. You have to go to full sky. Um, so it's sort of a UVW sphere, if you want. Um, <clears throat> but you can plot the phases of your measurements just like a little bit like a UV plot. Um, and here, what I've done is just uh, for the 10 baseline case, so we're also simulating for these newer baselines that will come along. But we've done it by assuming the same sort of gappy structure in the, in the current LIGO data. So, uh, LIGO data. so you see uh, that your, the Earth rotates around. It's plotted symmetrically on the sky because of the symmetry in the overlap function. But you see there's gaps in the data. So this is one day, the first day of the O1 data. Uh, so there's gaps, et cetera. But you know, eventually, after a number of days, those gaps will you know, uh, overlap, et cetera. And you'll get a complete phase coverage of, of the sky after a few days of integration. <clears throat> the latitude is a little bit constrained by the position of the detectors. OK? Uh, it'd be great to have detectors more close to the equator. Uh, that would be nice, but probably not happening anytime soon. Um, uh, India. India will be, will be a nice addition. You can get a sense of what scales that you can reconstruct on the sky by essentially doing a spherical harmonic analysis of the, the coverage of each baseline. Uh, it's difficult to do, and it's a bit controversial to do because it's not as useful as you might think. But you can basically, uh, allowing for your um, noise weighting, you can look at all the different baselines and say, what kind of multiple are they sensitive to on the sky? Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but basically um, uh, here we have uh, 
LIGO itself, okay, this coverage will be broadened out by the coupling of modes, but it just gives you a bit of an insight on the scale. Um, the other longer baselines will be sensitive to smaller, uh, smaller scales, larger multiples. Here, for reference, I've put L equals 32, which is the multiple, the Nyquist frequency of the maps that we're, I'm going to show in a second. Um, and this is important because if you try to push this too far, you'd be trying to reconstruct modes that you, you're not sensitive to, um, which is a, a, a danger in this, in this game. So the pixel of the Fourier domain here, there's a choice to be made, and in fact, we went for the pixel domain. Um, and that is because the analogy with the radiant interferometry needs to stop here. It's actually, um, quite, it takes you, it's not correct. Because of that full sky limit, okay, the coupling between modes that you're trying to reconstruct in the sky is, is very complicated. And if you try to reconstruct directly in the spherical uh, harmonic space, what you're doing is you're applying a sharp cut in your space and you're causing aliasing in your, in your final reconstruction. And that's a problem, I think, that people have had before. Um, the complication is that you're projecting 3D modes onto the sky, and that projection is not trivial, and it's, it's not an orthogonal projection, uh, to put it in technical terms. Um, so, <clears throat> so this maybe is alien to people working in radiant interferometry, because if you do that, you know, people working on radiant interferometry know that, oh, I'm reconstructing UV space, that's how I bin my, my data, and then only after I've done that, I apply something like the clean algorithm to try and invert it onto a sky map, okay, which is a complicated process in itself. Actually, the, in gravitational wave astronomy, that's not what you should do. So you directly reconstruct in pixel space is the thing that we learned, and that's what we did. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, what, we'll, what we did was basically write an algorithm to do maximum likelihood map making for gravitational waves. Uh, uh, well, this sums it all up, really. This is, this is your data, and it's a scan of the sky signal S using an operator A plus a noise, okay? So under some assumptions on the noise, that it's, uh, that it's a Gaussian uh, that you could describe using a covariance matrix N. Uh, in our case, of course, our data lives in frequency space. The sky is in pixel space. The noise lives in the domain of the data. That's always the case you want, the way you want to set it up. And so this operator A takes you from pixel space to frequency domain. And the mapping equation is this. You'll recognize it if you've done any sort of maximum likelihood map reconstruction. This is maximum likelihood map. All it is is basically a weighted sum of your data normalized by the inverse of the sum of the weights, right? So it, it's just a weighted sum. But it's all uh, it's non-diagonal, and so you, it's just described using matrices. So N here is the covariance matrix of the noise, and A and A transpose is just the operator that takes you to pixel space to frequency or frequency to pixel, okay? And so the maps we're, trying, we're reconstructing, if you're familiar with Helpix, they're inside <coughs> equals 8. That means there's about 768 pixels on the sky. And the, the Nyquist frequency is about uh, 32 in multiples, okay? And for visualization purposes, the maps we're going to show are smoothed, over smoothed to 10 degrees. Um, <clears throat> uh, this just goes into the details of, of how you write down these operators. Uh, I can skip that, but basically you do this exercise, you accumulate these operators on every 60 second segment and you do it to integrate the entire data that you have, okay? So a couple of months of O1 uh, data. Uh, and at each 60 second segment, we're rotating onto the sky. This is actually the secret weapon we deployed from CMB, okay? So this is... Uh, a certain quaternion rotation packages that, uh, uh, that you'll be familiar with. Um, it worked really nicely here. So was the data intrinsically released in a 60-second chunk? No, you have to... You so you've basically taken a, a large stream and you've made a, what is in effect a periodogram? And uh, basically, yeah, <clears throat> except it's not periodogram in the baseline of the d in the phase of the Earth. We, we're doing it much more inefficiently in some ways because we're going straight to the sky. But it generalizes much easier to multiple baselines than, of course, LISA, which will have a pointing solution which will be non-trivial, right? That's the whole point. So what happens, so, the, so basically the time chunk is a top hat? Is a top hat, yeah. Well, you have to window it. No, no, no the, the subtleties that, yeah. If there's spillover from one, 
Yeah, 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 yeah. So we didn't overlap, but of course you, you can overlap things to be more optimal. We haven't really uh, done anything more optimal than that. So we, it's basically a top hat. So there's correlations. <coughs> well, there's very small correlations between the chunks. But I think what LIGO does is actually, in a similar exercise, overlaps by 50% so that you're... So, so what I'm getting at is something really simple, right? Um, and I can see that it's actually the top line. You accumulate over all 67 segments. Yes. Now you actually are adding the time chunks together. Yep. And so each one, each time chunk is at some level treated as its own independent little map. Uh, no, because we don't do the inversion to recover the map. You only do the inversion once you've summed over all 60. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do it at, at, at any point, but you won't have, if it's less than a day, you won't have reconstructed enough modes, right? So the detailed information about frequency, about, you know, actual gravity wave frequency is lost. Why? Well, you aren't using it. Why not? Well, uh, because I don't see it in the equations. You, the, well, maybe it, it, so the way you constructed the D, the data vector, you, yeah. you write it as a function of frequency. Mm -hmm. Whose frequency is that? Because the frequency of split between frequency and time. No, no, you time chunk, so that limits your frequency range <clears throat> that you're covering. There's no point in, in Fourier transforming two months of data if you're not interested in inverse month time scales, uh, uh, frequencies, uh, okay, right? Okay, so each little mini map even though you say you don't do it, for time is, is an independent map. Yes, uh, yeah. With, with, with information in the frequency range uh, that is limited by your 60 second segments. But maybe we, we can well, talk I'm, about what that. What I'm getting at is you get all of these things that are blasting on to make your map. Yes. And um, it's like source, 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 yes. source. And so there's information in that. If, if you thought your sources had frequency, were lived in frequency domain on frequencies much lower than, than uh, 10 hertz, yeah, say, know, then you, you would want to make your segments much longer. But uh, that's not what LIGO is designed for. For LISA, LISA will be completely different in terms of the time chunking, yes. Let me just um, go ahead. There's certain, we, uh, to validate the pipeline, we did a certain number of tests uh, by basically injecting the frequency domain for LIGO baselines and also other newer baselines. We don't have data for those, but of course you can simulate it. Um, so um, we tested monopole maps, statistically isotropic maps, statistically anisotropic stationary maps and the same thing but non-stationary maps. I'll just mention in a second what those are. None of these, of course, are supposed to be realistic astro. There's no astrophysics that goes into these. These are just literally tautologies to show. So this is basically an example of a single, the single LIGO baseline and shows the reconstruction of a high signal to noise case and a low signal to noise case. And this is all for zero frequency dependence. In, so it's like an astrophysical source, OK? Um, <clears throat> and so it's a little moving. You can see how the high signal to noise one gets reconstructed very quickly, OK? And then the sort of the lower signal to, it's of course huge signal to noise with respect to what you did, the true signal, but it's uh, lower signal to noise. You can see that it's taking a bit longer to reconstruct. Um, convergence can be tested quite easily in these maps by looking at the standard deviation of the map, okay? So for high signal to noise, you immediately see as a function of integration time uh, that your map is already converged. And then as you go down in signal to noise, you see that it takes longer and longer to converge. Initially, you're dominated by a conditioning problem. I won't go into the details of it, but then you sort of fairly quickly on the time scales of a day or so reach uh, a sort of a nice scaling regime where it's one over root time, okay? For, uh, so for the convergence. So an important thing to test is how do you reconstruct a monopole? Because the monopole, if I, if I gave you a map and said, uh, how do I relate it to omega gravitational waves? I, I just take, well, what's the average of that map, the monopole? And that is, a, is basically related to the, to the gravitational wave uh, density. I, in this case, it's an integral over the frequency range that we've included in that, in that reconstruction. <clears throat> and so again, it's a high, so this is using three baselines because it works better with three baselines, but it's a high and low signal to noise or signal to noise one case. And you can see you reconstruct the thing. Um, you can't see it from the maps, but if you take the average of these maps, you reconstruct the input value to within a percent. Uh, of course, the structure on the maps is non-trivial because the noise 
ends up being, it's correlated in a very non-trivial way in these maps. And then a further test is to say, well, actually, things like LISA will see a very anisotropic sky because they'll see the galaxy, okay? So if you put in something which isn't uh, statistically isotropic on the sky, do you reconstruct it? Well, high signal to noise, again, this is using uh, three LIGO, Virgo baselines. It does really well. But in addition to that, you say, well, but the, but the signal isn't stationary in time, okay? So what if it's some sort of process where things, events are going off? Okay, so we sort of model that really simply by saying, you know, uh, basically taking, taking this input map, which is a Planck <coughs> dust map, basically, and saying, well, I have a Poisson process on the sky, and it goes off with the mean of the Poisson process proportional to the density of this, to the amplitude of this map. Uh, and so here, things are going off in the LIGO time stream. They're things that last 60 seconds because they're just, you know, it's just a, it's amplitude one lasting 60 seconds. But it sort of populates the thing. And eventually, if you integrate over enough time, you just recover the input map. You see, you see the distribution of the source on the sky. It's just, just a simple test. So I just want to finish with an application to the LIGO data. So this is very preliminary. So we just set the algorithm going on integrating, and we did, by the time I made this movie, we'd done a week of LIGO data, 01. Uh, and um, that's basically um, <clears throat> how it's integrating down. Okay, not very interesting. It's a movie, but it's not that nice. It's just noise. In fact, what I should really be showing is not the amplitude, but a signal to noise map. Okay, so as part of the algorithm, we can output also the noise covariance of the whole sky. So then you can modulate the, your final maximum likelihood map by that noise covariance and get something which is, you can roughly interpret as, as, sig, as, as signal to noise, like in sigmas, right? So going between, uh, you know, roughly plus or minus two sigma. <coughs> so you can tell that there's nothing significant in, in this image here, okay? The, none, of, none of the structure you see here is significant. It's all noise. It's just very complicated noise because it's correlated in a complicated way. But if you look at the standard deviation of the map, which is more useful than this, uh, you sort of, we've reached the level of it, this intensity, which is 2 times 10 to the minus 44. And you can get, basically, the number you can get is a is the gravitational wave background, which is roughly 3 times 10 to the minus 6. And the, you can compare that to basically this line in that little table I had, because the frequency dependence we assumed is, is equivalent to the, this um, astrophysical one. So, so it's comparable, so if, you know, this, comes from a few months of LIGO 01 data, I guess, that limit. So we should end up with similar, similar figures. Uh, we have to sort of refine this somewhat. Um, <clears throat> so that's basically essentially roughly where we are on this, this version of this, this uh, spectrum plot here. Um, OK, so just to summarize, uh, I think um, you know, this is a really important thing for future experiments in particular. But I think it's really interesting to do with LIGO. LIGO themselves have, of course, um, done some of this. Uh, they've done it in a very different way from the way we've done it. Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, you know, we're guaranteed to see some background. And I think guaranteed to see the anisotropies. And the anisotropies will have really interesting information. Okay. Uh, I mean, essentially, this will be multi-messenger -messen cosmology, right? Beyond the multi-messenger we're doing now to measure distance measurements, right? So H, uh, Hubble tests, basically. So this will be large-scale structure, potentially ISW, using gravitational waves, using multi-messenger, right? This is cool. You know, you'll be cross-correlating these maps with large-scale structure. Uh, so there's some standard law in map making with gravitational waves that need to be revisited. There's some, some sort of misintuitions have crept into the literature. Uh, I won't go into them now, but if you're interested, I can sort of discuss them with you. Um, <clears throat> and just to, um, to point out that you know we'll soon have analyzed the whole of LIGO 01 data. Maybe we could get our hands on proprietary data. That would be great. Um, but uh, the focus of the next will be to apply this to the LISA data challenge. They have a very nice simulation effort, LISA, which is basically outputting time streams, simulated time streams, uh, with injected uh, s sources, including stochastic backgrounds. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to, to, to do that. Another thing that we'll be applying this to is pulsar timing arrays, of course. You, you can uh, do the map making with that. Uh, and then, uh, of course, an ongoing effort will be to 
basically do cosmology with, with these outputs and forecasting what you can do in terms of um, uh, looking at the cosmology by cross-correlating with other data. I'll stop there. Thanks. That's the phase coherent approach, but I think it's hugely less efficient than assuming, well, I'm measuring something incoherent, and therefore I can integrate, literally square the data and integrate in some way, all of my data without having to search for segments where there may be some signal and there's some probably, you know, basically essentially characterizing all your signal, including the phase information. It, it's basically, if you think that there is an incoherent background, and I agree that that's why I showed those little cartoons where there's an intermediate space where the shot noise s signal is important. That, I think, a method like that would be more optimal. But if you can go integrate down into this more continuous um, background. Yeah, that's, that's why uh, it's not clear that the data set you're putting so much effort into is. Well, LIGO, but LIGO comes for free. I mean, uh, it, uh, it's. A really interesting question is, um, is taking a stochastic background. Yeah, yeah, when, when it's a uh, truly stochastic background, this is by far the most efficient way of doing it because you, you just simply won't get enough information in the time stream to say, oh, that's a possible signal, et cetera. <coughs> so uh, LISA is the real application here. But I think there is an application to LIGO, uh, but it's just interpreting the statistics of the map you get with LIGO is harder because you, you will at some point get a lot of shot noise contribution, which will sort of complicate the interpretation of it, right? So I think that difference, so one of the differences between your approach and the thing that Dick mentioned is that this, with this way you can effectively catch all possible... Every, everything, uh, yes. <coughs> uh, like background signal. Yep. Whereas if you, so if you want to specifically look for the unresolved uh, a binary signal, well, yes. which would then be a component of yeah, the yeah. then the uh, doing the phase coherent analysis. And yeah, I mean, this, I think this, what this, you're this, referring this, to the radiometer method, I think it's sort of what they refer to as the radiometer method, which is some, some sort of strange way of calling it, but where you assume there's a delta function, you haven't detected it in your time stream, but, no, so but you, you want to. Assume that you assume the same signal model as you. Yeah. Assume, but Assume for the result yes. Okay. So you're actually matching some sort of uh, yeah. uh, some phase matched signal. So, so if, <coughs> if, you, if you do that, then that is the, that is shown to be the statistically yes. optimal way of doing it. Yeah. It is currently hugely expensive. Though. It is hugely so expensive. That's it. Yeah. Because you're using all the phase information. Yeah. Okay. How much, how much at least of time do you need for you to start resolving the anisotropies? I, uh, I don't know, but Lisa will, will see a number of backgrounds at high signal to noise. So uh, in principle, not much time, right? Uh, so, but I haven't looked into the numbers yet to sort of say, quantify that. I think uh, you'll uh, in extreme. see it with LIGO because a lot of the sources are going to be uh, within the region in which the cosmic web is actually distorting it. Well, th think of it this way. Once you have a thousand LIGO sources, they will be correlated exactly on the sky in some way, uh, just like a Kobe map with a thousand numbers in it. You know, it, it not, you know, the structure will be very different, but it's a thousand sources will give you some information about the correlation. And yeah. it, it's, it's not unreasonable for there to be a thousand detections of Course, no, absolutely. Uh, I mean, if you've already measured six with a few months of data, you'll... Yeah, it's just you know. complicated by the fact that each, in our case, each measurement is a 40 square degree error box, right? 
sites or in some yes. we're also <coughs> Pinpointing them as precise as one would like. Yes. So they're really only going to be correlated with the most smooth large yeah. structure. Yeah. But then quite a large number of those you'll have optical and other frequency well, counterparts, maybe? Not for the binary black holes. No, not for the binary black holes. But, but you've seen one event that you have, uh, well, you've probably seen more, but you've seen at least one, and that's, that's already saying something about your statistics, right? So, so uh, you'll have the numbers, yeah, no it's question. Really wide binary transfer versus binary black holes. Yeah. Totally. I mean, one could hope that many of the binary transfers we'll see on the order of hundreds will, yeah. will be pinpointed much more accurately. So yeah. It's pretty cool. So one, one last comment, which is, so at roughly the same time as Lisa will be fine, fine ish that's when the, <coughs> hopefully, the third generation ground based detector should mm -hmm. be operational as a mid-20s Yes. Uh, and at their design sensitivity, they will resolve every binary black hole merger period. That's it, yeah. In the sense that you'll, you'll, you'll be able to see every all the black All the in spirals, yeah. I'll do redshift them. Yeah. And then the assumption is that beyond redshift 10, there probably weren't any yes. stars that could have the black holes. Isn't there a frequency limit on that? There is a bit, but it's... Most of them end up inside the right frequency range, right? Yeah. Well, because they're... Well, no, I think so... The VMOs, right, which is, you know, that's so 120 once, or so. Once you're above the total masses of a few hundred total sort of masses, then those, that's right. you might only really recover the frequency. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. even so, you would probably still... No, but, but then we're further going to range from 10. Yeah. Or more. No, but then, like, we can do that after range of Yeah. And also, so those will be. Are you saying that I only have to work limits. with wait till 2035 to get mm -hmm. the answer? Yes. Wait a minute. How old am I? How long will it take now to launch a satellite? Yeah, right. Well, the Chinese might get the best. Yeah, uh, well, I saw a talk from them.